I have a confession to make. I love shooting with flash bulbs. And uh, some of you may, may not know what a flash bulb is. Um, these have not been in production for over 40 years. So there's, I'm sure there's some of you out there that may not know. Uh, for those who don't know, a flash bulb is a single use bulb that you use to produce artificial light as a flash. Um, this came before electronic flash. It's really the true analog lighting for artificial lighting uh, for film photography. You can use them for digital photography too, but I'm gonna be talking about film photography today. Um, but it's a lot of fun. They create a, a unique experience <laughs> unlike pretty much anything else um, in that they are, it is burning a filament. So there's, um, there's a lot, it's a very visceral experience. So for this video in particular, I'm gonna cover um, some of the standard bulbs. So the one I was just showing is a number five or number 25, it's the same thing. Um, a later, smaller version is called an AG1, and these were very common in the 60s and 70s. There's a lot of these still out there, um, available for sale. Um, so you'll see flash bulbs on older cameras, um, everything from very basic setups like this old Kodak Duoflex, um, to, to more sophisticated setups, particularly from the 60s and 70s. Uh, this Petri 2.8 uh, is shown here with a, with a Honeywell Tiltamite, which was a fairly common flash unit. And I will be talking about all of these um, in the course of the video. And in terms of the wide range out there, I'm gonna cover everything from the tiny little AG1s um, up through these monster <laughs> number 50s which is the size of about a 150 watt bulb and, and creates a tremendous amount of light. So this is gonna be an exciting video for me um, and there may be more to come because there is a lot to talk about. The subject of flash bulbs is more wide ranging and complex than you might imagine. It's not possible for me to be able to cover adequately in this video a number of related topics, including the full history of flash bulbs, a detailed description of how flash bulbs work, flash bulb synchronization, or an in-depth discussion about flashbulb guide numbers among a variety of other topics. So those will likely have to wait until future videos. So this video is more of an introductory overview of flashbulbs and also I'd like to do a comparison of flashbulbs versus electronic flash. There were a wide variety of flashbulbs that were made over the years that flashbulbs were in production. This screen shows a selection of bulbs there are many more not shown on the screen here, but some of the more common ones you see on this in this image. The top row shows three bulbs that all use the medium screw base, which is the same type of base that you see in a standard light bulb. This is also known as an Edison base or a Mazda base. The flash bulb in the upper left corner, the Press 40, this was an extremely common bulb starting from the very beginning back in the 1930s up through about the 1940s. The number 22 and the number 50 along that top row were both uh, larger versions of the Press 40. The number 50 is a, a really powerful flash. <laughs> it's about, I think it's about six times power, more powerful than the Press 40. And then the next row, starting from the left with the number five, this, these bulbs were introduced in the mid to late 1930s and used a new bayonet type of base called a midget base. They were called midget because they were so much smaller than the previous um, medium base bulbs uh, like you see in the, the upper row. So those became popular in the late 1930s, really took off in the 1940s, and honestly remained kind of the mainstay of flash bulbs through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, even into the 1970s. In the 1950s, in an effort to, to make ever smaller bulbs, this style called the M3, which you see right in the middle, and M2, came out with a new, smaller version of the bayonet mount. This was called a miniature mount. As bulbs were becoming smaller and smaller and people were more interested in smaller equipment, another style of bulb, which you see in the right there, called the AG1, was released. This was what's called a capless bulb. And what that means is there's no metal base at all. The bulb is just all glass with a couple of contacts that stick out of it. And as you can see, quite small. The advantage here, obviously, being you could carry quite a few of these bulbs in your pocket much more easily than say like the number five, which in itself was a fairly small bulb. 
So starting, I think the, the AG1 was released in the late 1950s, close to 1960. And then toward the end of the 1960s, uh, another style of bulb came out, which you see in the bottom there, which is the flash cube. The number five, the AG1 and the flash cube, those remained in production through the 1970s. By the end of the 1970s, flash bulbs, as flash bulbs were really petering out, um, all of these bulbs, of course, were no longer in production. And by the early 1980s, uh, flash bulbs were essentially done. Now you might be asking yourself, why would I use flash bulbs in the year 2022? And really, there's a number of reasons. First of all, it's fun. That pop and sizzle and unmistakable smell you can't get anywhere else. Second, there's more light output typically from smaller equipment. For instance, a number five bulb has a guide number of around 260. It can offer better, softer modeling. And we'll look at that more when in the comparison later in the video. Probably one of the most compelling reasons for many people is that it is authentic for use with your vintage camera equipment. And did I mention it's fun? <laughs> it's like adding a pyrotechnic to your photographic experience. If you do decide to try out flash bulb photography, you'll very quickly realize that each bulb comes in a clear type and a blue type, and you may wonder why that is. And the answer is quite simple. Um, the clear bulb, which was the original style bulb, produces a light temperature that's close to incandescent light, um, interior lights. So with color film, it will create kind of a yellow cast if you use this without any filtration. The blue bulbs were designed to provide the correct color temperature for color film. Now you may be wondering, why don't I just shoot everything with blue bulbs and not worry about it since the black and white film won't pick up the color temperature anyway. The one thing to be aware of is the blue coating does take about one stop of light um, away from the bulb. So if you need maximum light output, go with the clear bulbs. If you are shooting with color film and you need correct color temperature, go with the blue bulbs. Okay, my intent is to do a comparison of different flash bulbs and also compare that against an electronic flash. And the flash unit I'll be using for the flash bulbs is this Honeywell Tiltamite. The Tiltamite was a very common flash. You'll still find many of them out there. Um, they're quite inexpensive because there are so many. So the way these units work, they have a, a, a fan type reflector that expands like that and then uh, has two positions. This is and what makes this flash so great um, is that the socket is designed as a three-way socket and can accept all three of the primary small size bulbs. So for instance, if I take this AG1 capless bulb, part of the socket uh, moves to accept that AG1 natively. If instead I'm using a miniature base bulb like this M2, a different part of the socket adapts to the same Base. So I can use the M2 with the same socket and in fact I can even use a, a number five midget base like this one and it just uh, conforms to a different part of the socket and plugs directly in like that. So, so this flash unit is incredibly versatile and as a result it's also going to be perfect for this test when I can use different flash bulbs with the exact same equipment. So that's what I'm going to use for the flash bulb in this comparison with the PC socket. And then for the electronic flash, um, I will be using this Vivitar 283. This was an extremely common flash from the 1970s. It's uh, probably one of the more powerful consumer level flashes that was produced at that time. Um, the 283 really was just kind of a workhorse. You'll, you'll find many of these out there as well. So it's a good point of comparison. And it also has a PC socket trigger as well. So this will be a perfect companion for the test. The camera I'll be using for this test is my Petri 2.8 1958. And I'll be shooting this Dracula 35 film from the Film Photography Project. I'm using the Petri 2.8 because it does include flash sync capabilities for both electronic flash and flash bulbs. 
it has X-Sync and M-Sync. Most higher-end cameras, starting around the mid-1950s up through the late 1970s, did include flash sync for both electronic flash and flash bulbs. I am using the Petrie because it is a leaf shutter and um, some of my other cameras that have both M-Sync and electronic flash sync are focal plane shutters, so they're limited um, as to what flash bulbs they can use. Flash bulb synchronization is a very complex topic and unfortunately is more than I can cover in this video, but I will try to cover it in a future video, so stay tuned. And there we have it. For the tests, I've chosen some very simple still life objects, some objects with some roundness and shape to them so they can show the modeling characteristics of the different lighting and I've pulled them back from the back or forward from the back wall just so that we can see how the flash affects the ambient light on the back wall as well. The light levels in the room are actually quite low, just they look a little bit brighter here in order for them to show up in video. I first shot with the Vivitar and then with the number five and lastly with the AG1. The first test shows the Vivitar results and you can see the shadows on the bureau are very harsh. Um, overall, it's a very contrasty scene. Next is the number five bulb. You can see it's much more evenly lit. The shadow on the bureau is much softer and not quite as deep. And lastly, the AG1 bulb, similar to the number five bulb, the shadows are very soft. The lighting is overall even, um, not quite as much as the number five. And then if we look at all three images together, you really start seeing the differences pretty clearly. The first thing I want to point out, look at the shadows um, cast by the stool on the bureau. In the Vivitar, the shadow is very harsh. It's very deep. There isn't any way to really recover anything. Uh, compared that to the two bulbs, the shadows are much softer. They're not quite as contrasty. And so they're much more pleasing and easier to work with. Now consider this is just a still life. So when working with the human form, these differences become even more apparent. I might explore that in a future video because the differences are quite dramatic when working with human skin in particular. But for this video, I just wanted to introduce the differences in how these flashes work. Obviously we could use flash modifiers on the electronic flash to, to help with some of these issues, but just looking at the raw on-camera flash, you can see they're actually very different. So that's it for this video. I hope to explore more advanced topics in flash bulbs in future videos, so stay tuned.